Don't despise. Getting wise. We're getting into Proverbs 4 here at KEM Social Hour. It's scripture social. We are. Impact Discipleship. <laughs> Woo. That's so good. That's so good. He just made that up on the spot. That's very good. But I think it's pretty appropriate for uh, our journey as we continue. As you guys know, I'm teaching every other week now uh, in Proverbs. And actually, yeah, come June, I'm going to miss a few weeks. So we need some testimonies to line up because I'm going to be away on vacation for a little while. Anyway, um, we're going to handle all 27 verses of Proverbs chapter 4 in a title called The Benefits of Wisdom. And, uh, you know, the first two chapters were all about wisdom. And then we had, uh, well, we could say the third one was, well, we called it Early Childhood Development. And here we are again, you know, with the idea of a parent talking to his child, um, giving wisdom and all the benefits of it. So we're going to cover that in three different sections today. I think I have a good take on a few of these things that will be very, very practical uh, for you. So if somebody has their Bible open and they're not looking at things they shouldn't, instead, open the Bibles. We're going to read the first nine verses proverbs chapter four who's got it who's got it anybody anybody i've got it but it's a translation that isn't i don't care translation is good James. is that is uh the, the scriptures what is that the scriptures no this is a uh, niv I think. niv is fine yeah NIV. Well, that'll work listen my sometimes to the father's instructions pay attention and gain I give you sound learning so that you do not forsake my teaching. For I too was a son of my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me, and he said to me, Take hold of my words with all your heart, keep my commands, and you will learn. Get wisdom, get understanding, do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom, for she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get yeah. wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Cherish her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. Mm. Thank you. Okay, so let's let's handle a couple of verses at a time as we go through um, the first two verses, uh, the instruction of a father, and it says, "Pay attention to the father. Pay attention to what the father has to say." And we're going to just go ahead and assume the deeper meaning here is this is instructions of the father, our. Heavenly Father to us, not just an earthly father. Of course, it does, it does uh, mean an earthly father to an earthly child, but the bigger picture here is a heavenly father uh, and his instructions to us and the tremendous benefits of that information. If you remember back in the first and second chapters when we actually were defining some terms, uh, instruction it refers to God's instructions which are equal to his word, his heart or mind on any matter as governed by his law. So that's, that's the intention here when we say instruction. It's not just, oh, let me give you some good advice. This is counsel coming from the, the word of God, equaling the law of God, equaling the heart of God. And uh, so we'll treat, the, we'll treat the role of the father in this passage as the heavenly father. And he says... You know, have good doctrine, sound teaching, sound doctrine. And, and he's step one, do not forsake my law. I want you to think of God's commandments, not as, you know, this list of do's and don'ts that make you feel anxiety, but rather the, 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 the stitching that holds together the fabric of the universe. And there are biblical laws, and we find them where? Sharp. Sharp young people, sharp young people on a Saturday morning in the Bible, <laughs> and um, and we have physical laws, all of which are used by God 
to operate creation, right? So you can picture that, right? If you open up the Bible, you start seeing, you might call them do's and don'ts, you might call them instruction and advice, wise counsel, uh, the light, the word, <clears throat> uh, statutes, judgments, lots of different terminology we see. But in the physical universe, there's also laws. And the God, this father of us all, created all of those, right? Biblical laws are used to define sin. As you know, 1 John 3, 4, which says, whoever commits sin commits lawlessness because sin is lawlessness. We also know that biblical laws are good. For those that think somehow as Christians, you know, you're trying to get under some yoke of bondage if you think God's laws are good. It says in the New Testament, referring to the laws in Romans 7, 12, therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, just, and good. And we, all, we know that those who understand the biblical laws have a great advantage. Also in Romans 3, first two verses said, what advantage has the Jew? Much in every way. Why? Because he was, to them was committed the oracles of God. So we know, we know the laws are good. Certainly they were applied wrong throughout many year, you know, ages. Uh, they can become legalistic, where you think you're righteous because you could keep God's laws under your own strength, um, and you can't do them without the power of God, can't do them correctly. We know that as Christians. <clears throat> but there's also physical laws. Physical laws of the universe were um, created by God. They're, they're not, they're equally created by God as his biblical laws, and breaking these commandments is not wise. Breaking the law is not wise, right? They're foolish. These laws keep planes in the sky and boats atop the ocean and they keep your feet on the ground, right? Um, I, I like to use the, I like to, I like to use the, the interaction between the devil and Yeshua in, in, the, uh, in the wilderness when he was finished fasting and the devil comes to him and says in the fifth verse of chapter 4, Matthew, he says, he took him up, on the, uh, up to the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in his hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. So the devil literally tempts Yeshua to jump off the corner of the temple, uh, and then he quotes the scripture saying, your father won't let you fall. Like he's not going to let you fall. And, and Yeshua's answer to that question was, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Translation. What would he be tempting? He'd be tempting his father to defy gravity. He would tempt some physical law. Some people would argue that it's not gravity, that gravity is whatever. But we know, we know, we know, Hashtag, hashtag flat earthers. We, I don't believe that. But I would say that they would tell you it's density and buoyancy or something like that. Anyway, I, I would say, I would say, whatever you call it, we all know that if we go up on a high spot and we jump, we go down. down. Yeah. And, if, and if it's high enough and the surface you're landing up on is hard enough you go splat, splat. <laughs> and so Yeshua says Are you crazy I'm not gonna do that <laughs> okay enough let's move on verse 3 back to Proverbs 4 verse 3 and 4 um, he talks about you know he starts off with hey when you were young when you were a little young one you know and or, when you were taught you know what he's saying when I was taught he says let me let your heart retain my words and keep my commandments and live. That's an important feature, this idea of uh, retaining God's word. It's one thing, uh, we're outside people today and it's a little windy, so hopefully you're not hearing that. So, so what does it mean to retain God's words, right? Because he has a lot of things to say that are critical. You should make knowing his word 
and remembering his word and remembering to keep his commandments a top priority, right? Just not knowing, the, oh yeah, I know that. It's like the devil just quoted, the devil just quoted the words of the scriptures, but obviously he has no interest in keeping the words of the scriptures. And so the, the key here is retaining the word means you are keeping the word, right? And it tells us here, interestingly enough, um, this idea of life. Commandments, obedience to God's commands equals life. I love what it says in Deuteronomy 30. If we think life and length of days, it says, See, I've set before you life and death. I mean life and good, death and evil. And that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to keep his commandments, his statutes, judgments. See those, those synonyms? Commandments, statutes, judgments. It says that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you possess. That's in, starting in Deuteronomy 30, 15. If we skip ahead to verse 19, skip ahead to verse 19, he says, I call heaven and earth as a witness against you today that I've set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice. You see this common theme? And that you may cling to him, for he is your life and length of days. Some of you who are tracking in the last chapter of Proverbs, you remember, remember the distinction I made when we studied the first two verses. Do you remember the first two verses of Proverbs 3? It says, my son, do not, same theme, do not forget my law, let your heart keep my commands, for length of days and long life and peace will be yours. And the distinction was long life was the idea of you obey God and your years are lengthened in a sense. Length of days is you obey God and your days are longer. And the only way to get a longer day is to need less sleep as far as what I'm concerned. Meaning, or maybe it's just that you're just more productive. You ever have days where you feel like I got so much done today and there's other days where you feel like the day clicked by and you said nothing happened. I accomplished nothing. I think when you're living in radical obedience to God, your days will appear very productive and useful and filled with, um, with accomplishments, and so to speak. And the bottom line is, this very same writer of, of these early Proverbs said in another book that he wrote called Ecclesiastes, the very end of that book, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. It's like, it's like he was putting an epithet at the end of his life and saying, this is where it's at. Fear God and obey his commandments. Right? In, in, in a, a letter about his life, right, 1 Kings 3.14, around, around this, um, somebody speaking to him, the prophet, so if you walk in my ways, God speaking through him, if you walk in my ways and keep my statutes and commandments as your father David, we know it's talking about Solomon, then I will lengthen your days. So we have this promise. Right? So how are we going to do that? How do we like become creatures of obedience? The proverb says, get wisdom, get understanding. Don't forget or turn away from them. Don't forsake her. She will preserve you. Talking about wisdom. Love her and she will keep you. You know, it's back to the same concept, right? It's about good doctrine. It's under the same heading here. Get wisdom. Do you remember a few chapters ago we, stud we studied what that meant? We simplified it to this. The application of godly knowledge and understanding. See, it's not wise if you know what to do and don't do it. If you understand what to do and don't do it. But it's wise if you know and understand what to do and you do it. Right? And understanding is the proper perception of God's intention. Right? It's the idea of standing under something. It's standing under a belief. It's standing 
uh, um, it's standing in agreement with something. That's what understanding means. But you have to understand, you have to have proper connection to God's intention to have understanding. Otherwise, you're making up your own stuff. Right? So you, you, can't, you can't say, you know, um, you know, you know, God is all about love, so as long as I'm loving the person I'm with, then it's perfectly fine that I'm having sex outside of marriage. Because I understand God to mean that, more importantly, it's love. And then, of course, we have a song, Love the One You're With, right? Whatever. So we can make up doctrine about anything, right? That would be improper understanding, right? So do not forsake wisdom. God's word is not meant to use for private interpretation for an individual to use as rationalization for his personal choices that would otherwise be contrary to God's intention. Amen. Do not forsake it. Do not forsake it, and it will preserve you. Can't you see how when you make choices outside of God's will, your life goes sideways, it goes haywire. Right? Even, though you're, even though you're making those choices because you think it's going to help you or because it's going to give you pleasure. That's not wisdom. The proverb says, do not forsake wisdom. Right? It says, love wisdom. What God says about any matter is uncompromisable. If you love it, it will keep you in the center of God's will. I love what, what, what um, David says in Psalm 119. We're going to quote Psalm 119 a few times. By the way, that's the longest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses. We're going to quote two of those verses. In this study, I think two. It says, How can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? I think 175 of 176 verses have some synonym for the commandments of God. Statutes, laws, judgments, precepts, righteousness, light, word. That's 119.9. 119.9. Anyway, so it's, it's how can you keep your way pure? How can you cleanse your way except by heeding God's word? You understand, like if I said to you, adultery is wrong because... The only proper answer is because God says so. That's the answer. Not, it hurts people, or, you know, my so-and-so told me, or, like, you may, as it hurts people, and somebody may tell it to you, but the only reason that makes it true is because God says so. The yeses and the noes are according to God. They're not according to man. Right? Okay, we'll move on to verse 7. Only 27 verses today, right? Wisdom is the principal thing. Get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. You know what this is saying. Um, wisdom is the predominant, most foremost thing, right? It's the predominant attribute. And while you're on your way to it, you better have proper perspective as well, right? Like you can't have wisdom without understanding because you'd be applying something that was on its surface or even underneath the surface incorrect. It's not wisdom to apply something that's untrue. <laughs> so on your way to get wisdom, make sure you get understanding. You need to know what God intends before you start acting, right? I love this because, because it reminds me of the men's Bible study I've been part of for a very long time that was started by my neighbor, Sergeant Eric Lawrence, Rangers of Christ. We call it ROC, R-O-C. It has 12 attributes we recite every week. Wisdom, courage, strength, purity, integrity, humility, patience, kindness, gentleness, diligence, self-discipline, self-control. Somebody gets called on each week, usually a newer person. Can you recite these? You know, I used to recite these when my children were growing up. I would pray it over them when I was putting them to bed at night. Sometimes I would do it backwards, right? But notice the first one, wisdom. That's why Eric put it here, because wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the principal thing. Okay, and again, while you're at it, make sure you get understanding because otherwise you'll have wrong perspective and you don't want to apply what's wrong. Then it goes on in eight and nine to talk how you should treat it. How should you consider it? It says exalt her, embrace her. Exalt her, embrace her, talking about wisdom. And then there's a result of that. When you exalt wisdom, it's giving wisdom its proper place in your life. 
And the result is that you advance in the areas you're applying it. What a beautiful formula. Give wisdom her proper place and you'll advance because of it. Embrace wisdom. That's, that's the idea of holding wisdom in your heart. And it will bring you honor and respect and an excellent reputation, right? It gives, it gives you these things. I think your verse said, um, uh, forget what, how you read it. Mine, it says, ornament of grace and a crown of glory. Yours said, not ornament. It was uh, another. Garland. Garland. To grace your head. Yeah. So, so, so I, think of it, I think of it like, I think you can wear wisdom like, like a necklace almost, like something around your neck as if you're wearing God's grace um, like a collar, you know, like a dog collar almost, uh, that's leading you like a dog on a leash. So like if you're willing to wear wisdom around your neck, it's like you're willing to be yoked to God. It's like he's latching onto your neck and pulling you, if you can picture this, with a leash. But isn't that what you want to be pulled by? It's like God's wisdom is pulling you by your neck and it's yanking you in a direction. And that, exactly, right? <laughs> and it'll appear like glory emanating from your, your head, or really, I would say, from your mouth. Like being, and I think this in context, because he's going to start talking about the mouth later on. Uh, and, it's, and it can be worn like a crown, right? It's like the glory of God. Okay, excellent. Let's move on. Middle section. Who's got their Bible open today? Denise? I want you to read Proverbs 4, 10 to 19. 4, 10 to 19. 10 to 19, yes. My child, listen to me and do as I say, and you will have a long, good life. I will teach you wisdom's way and lead you in straight paths. When you walk, you won't be held back. When you run, you won't stumble. Take hold of my instructions. Don't let them go. Guard them, for they are the key to life. Don't do as the wicked do. And don't follow the path of evildoers. Mm. So, you see now we, we're changing gears here, right? This is not relevant for what's going on here in our midst here. I was just thinking that. Right? So, here he says, Here, my son, the years of your life will be many. Hear these things. You know, you've been taught the way of wisdom and the right paths. You know, do this. Your steps won't be hindered. You won't stumble, right? What's the way of the way of wisdom? You might even say synonymous with the way of wisdom is the right path. Like, wisdom will grant you the life God intended for you. That's a nice use. You will avoid, tell me this is not benefits. This is all benefits of wisdom. You will avoid silly things that will damage your life. Amen. The direction God intends for your life will be obvious. Do you want that? Oh, yeah. Obvious. You will not be constantly tripping over your own feet as everything you attempt to accomplish feels like you are walking through mud. These are benefits of wisdom. Right? He goes on to say in the 13th verse, hold on to instruction. Keep her. Keep her close. Right? She's your life. Instruction, God's instructions are equal to his word. We said this earlier. His heart or mind on any matter as governed by his laws. You're supposed to hold them close in your heart and let them govern your entire life. Again, this is the benefit of, of wisdom. From 14 to 17, he changes gears and starts talking about wickedness. He says, avoid the path of the wicked. Hmm. So much you can't make this up. Do not walk in the same direction as evil. Do not entertain evil even a little bit. That road has nothing to do with you. Even if it appears tempting, run from it as it only leads to destruction. I love what Yeshua said, famous. You know it, right? Enter by the narrow gate because wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it because narrow is the gate and Difficult is the way that leads to life, and there's few who find it. But you have to recognize evil. Evil, evil people and evil in operation, they are relentless. Or I mean, I mean they are they are 
restless, let me say restless, unless they are involved in something bad that will lead to someone getting hurt. Evil people are never satisfied unless they're hurting someone, unless they're on the path to destroying somebody's life or destroying something. They always bring destruction. So that's how you can recognize them. This is their, this is their nourishment. It says it, this is their nourishment. This is their food. Wickedness. What is wickedness? Wickedness is a twisted view of reality. Wicked literally means twisted. It, it, that, it can't, it, the root word is the word that's used to make the wick of a candle, that they twist the candle, wick. It often progresses from slightly off the truth and eventually becomes 180 degrees opposite of truth. Welcome to the modern world. Just watch the news, you see wickedness everywhere. That's food, food. First, food of the evil, wickedness. Second food, violence. A ruthless, bloodthirsty force that intends to harm anything in its path. And that which is in its path, path may be arbitrary, as it cares not what it destroys, but most often it has its sight set on something specific. Violence. People, the only way to defeat, to defeat violence is with violence. But in our case, it's spiritual violence. It says in Matthew 11, 12, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. We have to be a spiritually violent people to combat the wickedness and the violence of today. Proverbs 13. Proverbs 13 uh, 418 comes with a little bit of a story. Let me read it to you. It sounds a little confusing, right? Like, on the surface, you may not catch exactly what it means. It says, the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. As it progresses, right? In what? The path of the just is like a shining sun that shines ever brighter to a perfect day. This is what it means. The this, this is literally an implication of the path to becoming like Christ. The path, this is the sanctification process of the saints. The path, this process. I love what it says. We studied this back in, in Thessalonians a few months back, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3 to 5. It says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. And then he says, that you should abstain from sexual morality. Like, why is that the example? Because that's not the only thing to deal with when you're dealing with sanctification. Why is that the example? Well, sanctification is the process of becoming holy, right? Completely set apart for God. Sexual immorality is the chief thing that violates the image of God. It's the most quintessential example of what, of what is anti-God. It's not the only thing. It's just the chief thing, right? It's the principal thing that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel and sanctification and honor. That's living your life with wisdom and understanding the way God intended, right? That's the whole process here. Not in the passions of lust. And then he, compar he compares, uh, Paul compares. He says, like the Gentiles who don't know God. Uh, let me shorten this. Be sanctified, become like Christ. Don't be like the Gentiles who don't know God. That's what he's saying. So he says, he says, the path of the just, those who pre represent God in the earth, will take their rightful place of authority in the earth. Right? That's you. It says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though Christ were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians 5.20. You're ambassadors, right? You are the rep representatives. And, and the ultimate place of authority, I think is so cool. This is another one of these scriptures. You, if you dig just below the surface, you see how magnificent it is. In Psalm 94, 15, it says, the judgment will return to the righteous and all the upright in heart will follow it. Meaning, the judgment seat, the place of authority in the earth will return, will return to God's righteous people. And those that want, want it are going to be glad. They're going to be like, thank God the good people have taken over. Right? And then what is this shining sun? 
The shining sun, of course, is the glory of the Lord emanating from his people, right? And it says, it says in 2 Corinthians 3, uh, the Lord is spirit, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, here it is, as beholding in a mirror, are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory, just as, the spirit, as by the spirit of the Lord. So, so every time you look in the mirror, he's saying you should be looking more like Jesus, from glory to glory. That's the, sh that's the path, so you can picture it. The whole picture of that verse is the sun comes up and it's a kind of a glowing ember and as it rises to the peak of the day, the perfect day, it's referring to when the sun gets to the peak in the sky when it's its brightest. So are God's people being transformed into that perfect brightness of the sun at the peak of the day through a process. That's what the verse means. I know this because years ago I made it the slogan for a consulting company that I founded called Full Stature Consulting. And the whole goal of the consulting company was to transform God's people into the image of Christ. And that was the process. It starts and it starts off like a slow, low glow. And they, and they, and they move and progress like the sun moves through the sky and eventually hits the peak and the brightest and the hottest part of the day. And of course, the full stature came right out of Ephesians 4, uh, 11 to 13, right? When he talks about the fivefold ministry, again, some of the apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service until, so that's the purpose of the church, until we all come to the unity of the faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the fullness, there it is, to the fullness and stature and image of Christ. The whole ministry of the church is to transform itself into the image of Christ. And what an amazing consulting firm that was going to be if all I was going to do is focus on consulting. And by the way, that, that, that did does, it still exists today um, with clients, but it mostly transformed into discipling young people. I got away from mostly clients. I hardly have any clients, ironically, that pay me. And I have only a bunch of young people that I disciple. And that's, that's pretty funny, right? Anyway, let's continue. Now he goes and he starts talking about the wicked ones. He says, look at this. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. So you see the opposite is the shining sun, the light, the brightness. Wicked, opposite. They, the wicked are groping in darkness. They're, in, they're constantly tripping over themselves. Have you guys seen this any time recently? They're constantly tripping over themselves, never open their eyes to see what's causing them to stumble. Right? They keep repeating the same thing over and over again, and they can't see because they have the opposite of the sun rising into the sunlight. They have, they have darkness, right? Okay, last section. We're speeding through. We're doing great, people. Who wants to read? Is anybody? You guys are anti-Bible today? My phone serves as a distraction right now, so I put it down. I'll use his Bible. Which, okay. Uh, which... We're in Proverbs 4, 20 to 27. Go ahead. Starting in which verse? Uh, 20. 2? 4, 20. To tw all the whole way. Yeah, it's the rest of the chapter until 27. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. They are right to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do, close from it. Keep your mouth <laughs> free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths of your feet and be steadfast in all of your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. Awesome, awesome. So he starts off in the first couple of verses there in 20 to 22. And he says, this is your source of life. This is your source of life and health. God's words and sayings. I mean, obviously the theme through this whole thing. Matter of fact, through the whole first four chapters. The, the source of your life is God's word and sayings. I like to say, as you guys know here, think in Bible. Think in Bible is, the sim is similar in concept to learning a foreign language. This is a voluntary and purposeful process. At first, it is awkward and cumbersome as you systematically translate your known language into your new language. But eventually you no longer need 
to think in your old language to function in your new language, right? You will automatically begin to think in your new language. That is what it means to think in Bible. You must embark on a journey to replace every thought of man with the mind of Christ. You must learn to think in Bible. Become so familiar with God's word that it is literally literally reprograms your brain. It will feel like God is rewiring your DNA, DNA to become Christ-like. That's the idea of it being the source of your life and health. Focus on God's word. And I said I was going to quote Psalm 19 twice, 119 twice. Focus on the word because it says, it talks about keep them in, the, in, in, in Proverbs 4. It says, keep it in the midst of your heart. Psalm 119, 11 says, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. See, that's the whole thing. You're, you're hiding it deep in your heart. Then in Proverbs 4, 23, it, it, it continues with the heart theme. It says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Diligence. Conscientious. conscientious. Uh, be particular to protect what is in your heart, which, is, <clears throat> which biblically means your mind. Right? Like, you have to be diligent. Purposely protect your heart. Purposely protect your mind. Now, we can do a whole study on the heart and mind, but I'm going to give you two verses just so you can kind of like say, oh yeah, that's what it is. Proverbs 23, 7, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The heart is the mind. Jesus, Matthew 12, 34, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We know it is the, the heart is the mind. Every issue of your life is affected by how you think. You might want to write this quote down. Ready? How you think is affected by what you see, hear, say, and do, and where you go. So protect your eyes, ears, mouth, hands, and feet. How you think is affected by what you see, hear, say, do, and where you go. So protect your eyes, ears, mouth, hands, and feet. And all that was really a lead-in to the last, the last verses, 24, 25, 26, and 27 of today's study. <clears throat> Let me just read that to you again. It says, put away from you dece a deceitful mouth and perverse lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. Right? So I'm going to talk about some of these human attributes. Your voice. What you say will promote life and peace or death and destruction. Ephesians 4.29 put simply, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. You literally can either kill somebody with your words or supply God's life-giving grace with your words. So be careful what comes out of your mouth. James, in this more lengthy passage, describes in detail the power of the tongue. This is the third chapter, starting in the fifth verse of James. It says, even so the tongue is a little member and boasts a great thing. See how great a forest a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among its members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it, it, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of a beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed for, by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings, my brethren. These things ought not to be so. Guard your mouth. My mother used to say, probably everyone's mother here used to say, if you have nothing to say, don't say anything at all. Right? 
Everybody's nodding their head, right? The next thing, so we can kind of continue, is our, our eyes. It says, direct your eyes straight ahead and do not let them be filled with evil. Do not look upon that which is unclean, lest you be influenced by it, and thus influence others with it. Now, I taught this when we taught through Matthew. I didn't, I didn't pull notes from there. I just remembered some of the concepts when I was remembering Jesus' words about it. It's very powerful, often overlook, overlooked. And it says, Matthew 6, 22 and 23, it says, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness. I want you to get this. This is very important about the human eyes. The eyes are both a transmitter, light, coming out, and a receiver, a window. They emanate either light or darkness, and they are windows into the soul which is affected by what they receive or look upon. Two ways here, transmitters and receivers, receivers the eyes. That's why you could look into people's eyes and see darkness. Ooh. Just turn the television on today, and most of the politicians in control of the world today, and, and, and some of the assigned officials that we see, you look in their eyes and you see darkness. If you're a Christian, you'll recognize it. It's very easy to recognize. It's so obvious that it's there. All right? Um, lastly, your feet. I love this. I love, and, and, and uh, later in this Proverbs it says, in 16.9 it says, the, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Ponder your path. Let him establish your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Do not for a moment involve yourself in anything evil. If you stray, Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet says this, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right or the left, or whenever you, whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left hand. Lit, literally listen, if you are off base, you will hear a voice some indicator saying, not that way, go this way. I'll finish, finish with what that way is to the Lord. I'm going all the way back into the prophets again. Jeremiah 6.16, it says, The Lord says, stand in the way and see, and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it, then you will find rest for your souls. Amen? Amen? So that is the benefits of wisdom. That is the entire chapter four of Proverbs. Uh, next time we meet together with, with, with me teaching, we are going to do Proverbs five. It's 23 verses. Tune in people. It's called the lips of the immoral woman. I'll see, I'll see you guys then.